My name is Chloe McGann, and I'm a senior at River Hill High School, reporting as managing editor of River Hill student-led newspaper, The Current. Upcoming is an interview with Howard County Executive, Dr. Calvin Ball, an inspiration and role model to many. Dr. Ball works hard to make Howard County data-informed, people-driven, and full of opportunities for all. In 2006, Dr. Ball made history as the youngest chairperson elected on the Howard County Council. And in 2018, he made history again as the first African-American elected as Howard County Executive. I hope you enjoy this interview. So jumping right in, January is a time when seniors in Howard County are hastily finalizing college applications or figuring out their post-secondary plans. This requires conceptualizing who they want to become and how they can get there. Did you anticipate serving as a county executive when you were a student in high school? What background led your career trajectory to where you are now? Well, I love the way that you phrased that question because I think too often people focus on what you want to be when you grow up as opposed to, like you said, who do you want to become? And I always knew that I wanted to make an impact, a positive impact in people's lives, but honestly, when I was in high school and going into college, I wanted to be a Supreme Court Justice. And I was excited to be like my hero, Thurgood Marshall. And then when I was working on my master's degree, we had a mock trial course where I was the lead attorney for the defense. And I realized at that time, I wasn't as interested in going to law school as I had always thought I would be. And then that summer I became a certified mediator because I wanted to focus on bringing people together. So while at that time I never really didn't even know what a county executive was, I know I wanted to help people. Awesome. That's a very um, service-oriented approach, which uh, we really appreciate. So you mentioned Thurgood Marshall um, be being a role model. Um, can you elaborate more on uh, how his impact on you? I was captivated by the notion of someone who would use their gifts and talents to help create more opportunity for others. And that is something that has followed me throughout my career of service, really trying to help those and give voice to the voiceless and empower people who are often, they feel like they're forgotten or invisible to society. And I think Thurgood Marshall, with his work uh, on the NAACP and civil rights and then being a Supreme Court justice, always upheld those ideals. So almost 60,000 residents in Howard County are students. How do you ensure their voices are represented in your decision making? So I think the student voice is critical. It's critical for a number of reasons. As you noted, uh, being uh, nearly 60,000, uh, people in the population, probably even a little bit more. But I think also the students represent the future. And while we can learn from the past and we live in the present, we're building for the future. And so making sure that we engage on social media, I, when I can, visit schools, talk with students. We send out a weekly newsletter, the Ball Bulletin, so that students can get information. And we try to make sure that we do have an interactive conversation with our student population so that not only are they educated, but they're empowered to become their best selves and have a voice in governing Howard County. Well, yeah, because students are important. Um, going from students to then just overall, how was serving Howard County in 2021 um, and was it different than from previous years? Likely it was. It was, it was very challenging. You know, uh, this past year has been one of the most difficult in our county, our state, our nation, our world history. And, you know, I know that oftentimes people have feel like the term unprecedented has been overused, but there really was no precedent. There was no guidebook for how to govern during a pandemic, a pandemic that we were trying to learn and understand at the same time where people were struggling sometimes with physical and mental health, but even just to put food on the table 
keep a roof over their head. We saw schools going virtual and uh, educators and kids struggling with that. And so it was very difficult. However, I think it helped remind us of the things that we fight for, the things that we care about, the things that are really important. And while sometimes there was anxiety and there was fear, it allowed us to continue to grab on to hope. Yeah. A lot of people were faced with a lot of impossible choices between food, housing, and you're sort of setting now that guidebook that you mentioned. Are you creating ways to pass along what you've learned through this unprecedented time to future county executives? Yeah, great question. So I have frequent meetings with not only my team, but other county executives along the region. And we've been trying to make sure that in our communication, whether it's online, the ball bulletin, different town halls, that we do memorialize what we're learning while we're learning. And then my hope is once we actually do finally beat COVID and get to a better place, we can take a reflective posture and really think about over the last few years, what did we learn and how can we build a better society for all uh, when we all face these kind of challenges? Yeah, definitely. So in 2019, Dr. Calvin Ball launched the It's Okay to Ask campaign to reduce youth su suicide with Howard County Council member Christiana Rigby. In the 2020 proposed budget, you dedicated $2.2 million to bike routes, an amount nearly four times higher than just a few years ago. And in 2021, you, initi you initiated portable COVID testing sites, which alternate locations for more equitable health and wellness resource access. How do you uncover these community needs, Dr. Ball? Well, thank you. I think just interacting with the community, all facets, a lot of research. You know, for example, from 2014 to 2018, suicide was the number one cause of death for our young people ages 15 to 19. And that was staggering, and I knew that we needed to do more. As we are trying to connect more people, Having a truly multimodal transportation system where people can not only drive, but also take mass transportation, bike, walk, is something that not only connects our community, but gives people ways to have accessible routes to get to where they need to go. And, you know, I think at a time when people are so afraid of whether or not they have COVID, expanding the testing opportunities was something that was critical. So I think listening more than talking and really trying to ensure that everyone, again, had a voice, allowed us to see what are the community's priorities and what are not just the community, but the people who are most vulnerable and in need, what are their priorities and how can we help? Yeah. As... Um a leader within my school, I've noticed that just drawing from other leaders in, isn't always as representative. So listening to those voices that are more hidden and their needs and addressing them as well is that's, very important. That's very perceptive. You know, they're oftentimes the very loud voices of the people who come to every meeting and they're very knowledgeable. And those are important voices. But it's the people, you know, for example, in Howard County that maybe because they're working two or three jobs, or they're focused on raising their family or you know, taking care of their older parents, or maybe they have a disability or they have limited English proficiency, whatever the reason, sometimes access to those conversations is a barrier. And the more we can break down those barriers, the better job we can do ensuring the very best quality of night life, not just overall, but for all. Yeah, so powerful. Um, and so how can students learn about the campaigns and the initiatives you're leading? What can students do to share their voice with you and get more involved? So I think, you know, we, we try to communicate pretty actively uh, via social media, emails, um, town halls, wonderful conversations like today. And I love hearing the student voice. I love the perspective and it just also engages people because the more that they have a seat at the table, the more 
they feel like part of not just the problem, but the solution. And the more all of us are part of the solution, the more we can move forward together. And so I think just, you know, look on our website, drop me an email, reach out. Awesome. Um, and so we had a student question by uh, um, Adam Wong at River Hill High School, and he was wondering... So with these policies that you're implementing, have you thought about the long-term effects and any repercussions they could have in the far future? So they may have positive effects and changes um, within the next couple of years or the next couple of months, but where do you see these things uh, helping people maybe 10 years in the future? Or do you even think they're going to last that long? Great question, Adam. You know, for example, one of the things that we've been working on while I've been county executive is just investing in building more schools. So we are expanding Talbot Springs. We're expanding Hammond High. We have a new high school 13 that should be opening up. And when that opens, it'll be the first new high school in Howard County since 2005. Those are long-term things, investing in our parks like Troy Park, Blandaire, Centennial Park. These are things that I think will be long-lasting. And then having those... Um, I guess those written communication about why, most of us really focus on the what, but when we also talk about the why, it helps people understand the rationale and the thinking, and as the world changes and the what's change, we can still focus on the foundational principles that make Howard County a great place and continue to do better things for more people. Yeah, I love that you're, uh, you mentioned parks as well, um, resources that a lot of students have turned to during COVID as an outlet to get outside um, without a mask and through sports and all of that. So the parks as well as the schools are definitely long lasting. So that's a great answer. Great. Um, what factors do you balance when taking impactful action and addressing community needs? Um, is that county council involved in your action? Yeah, I try to really involve everyone in that way. And, you know, it's tough. I think one of the most challenging aspects of being a leader, as, as you're probably learning, is you can't make everybody happy all the time. And that's really tough. And, and you know, Howard County has, has almost 330,000 residents. And I would love to try to make everyone happy all the time. And it's just not possible. So... I think if we can do the things that we need to do and try to continue doing the things that we want to do and make sure that people understand why we're doing things and make sure that they feel heard, we can kind of be still impactful. And I think that includes all the voices from other elected officials to students to every aspect and every corner of Howard County. And how do you approach criticism when that does come? Because as you said, you can't always please everyone in your decisions. You know, it's funny. I, I actually, um, <laughs> when I was very young, I remember in my early 30s and late 20s when I would be criticized, the very first thing that I would think, my parents are going to read that. <laughs> and then as I got older, I really looked at I try to understand the rationale because I'm constantly working on trying to improve. And sometimes criticism is very fair and reasonable. Sometimes even the very mean criticism can be helpful in improving because sometimes if people are lashing out, there is an underlying reason. Then some people are just mean. And so, you know, I think trying to discern the differences so that I can continue to grow and improve and get better and serve Howard County's interests for current and future generations is where I really try to focus. Yeah, and looking for if there's a deeper hurt that's there that's exactly. causing the lashing out. That's right. We just reached a new year, and I'm wondering what are some of the obstacles and opportunities that you see coming in 2022? So I think we're going to continue to work on addressing issues related to COVID, uh, trying to keep people safe and healthy, 
uh, working on mental health. We're all tired of COVID, and we're all, frankly, done with COVID, but COVID ain't done with <laughs> us, so we have to work on that. Uh, the long-lasting financial implications, where we see challenges with the supply chain, working, uh, making sure that we're continuing to focus on uh, whether it's rental support, home ownership support, how do people continue to learn in these challenging times. So I think 2022 will be a year of still trying to make sure that people are okay while still investing in our priorities like education, the environment, public safety, economic development, the things that make Howard County a wonderful place to be. Yes. Um, and have you ever had to go back on decisions or plans that you have for 2022 or even in the past um, due to whatever reason? Yeah, I mean, I think leaders should always adjust. You know, the, the only thing that's pretty constant is change. And so I think that's oftentimes... A that's you. a good quote. <laughs> oftentimes we have plans and... You know, plans need to be adjusted. And so it can be frustrating, but even more than that, it can be an opportunity. Definitely. What is motivating your decision to run for re-election? I've read about people wondering if you were going to go for Maryland governor, um, but you are choosing to run for re-election for the Howard County executive uh, position. And so what is the reasoning behind that? Does it have to do with some unfinished business that you hope to complete in 2022 um, and the future years to come? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I was very honored when many people asked me to consider running for other offices. You know, when one of my mentors passed away, Congressman Elijah Cummings, people asked me to consider running for that congressional seat. A lot of people asked me to consider running for governor, as you noted. Here I am, I just finished up my third year as county executive, and almost two of them have been in COVID. I still have a lot of things that I want to accomplish, and some things could be done in the short term, some medium, and some will take more time. And so I think I want to be able to accomplish more things for the people of Howard County. And um, moving on to a different office with this much unfinished business isn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to continue to work on the things that matter and make Howard County a, a great place to live, work, play, and to grow. That's a great reason. <laughs> <laughs> and in the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. Day this upcoming Monday and the first posthumous pardon of Plessy, why do you believe fostering diversity, equity, and, and inclusion within Howard County is so important? Well, number one, I think that we are all stronger when we're all empowered and we're all seen. I also think that Howard County is the example for the state, the nation, and the world. So when we do things well here, we send a message to all around the world, but also a future message of not just what is, but what can be. Howard County, home to Columbia, was a place where you could have interracial marriages when they were illegal in some places, where women could be elected. Howard County elected the first female county executive in the state of Maryland, the youngest county executive in the state of Maryland, making sure that we send a message that young people's voices matter. And so I think when we work hard and we do well here in Howard County, we really let people know it can happen. And talking about that example, do you communicate with fellow Maryland uh, government service leaders um, or and even nationwide? I do. I was honored to be part of the National Association of Counties uh, Economic Empowerment uh, Seminar, and there were 20 of us selected from about 3,000 jurisdictions and was part of a Gates Foundation uh, initiative. I'm also uh, first vice president in the Maryland Association of Counties and I meet regularly with uh, the mayor of Baltimore and 
the county executives from uh, six other jurisdictions, and the eight of us represent more than 50% of the population in the state of Maryland. And that allows us to have conversations about things like public safety, health, wellness. And so I find that uh, good leaders either mentor or are mentored, and great leaders do both. Awesome. It has been such a privilege and pleasure to interview you today. Um, Dr. Ball, is there a quote, inspiration, or message you'd like to leave the students of Howard County as they begin 2022, a year anticipated to bring more challenge and social liberation? Well, I think maybe in the spirit of Dr. King, I would just remind you of the quote, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl, but by all means, keep moving forward. And during these challenging times, keep moving forward. Wow. Thank you again, Dr. Ball. That was truly powerful. This is Chloe McGeehan reporting to you from the County Executive Office within the George Howard Building, wishing our greater Howard County community a safe, peaceful, and positive Martin Luther King Jr. Day and 2022 New Year.